Hi, everyone. Yeah. Who, here is, uh, who here has not heard of Bitcoin ordinals? Oh, okay, I should ask the other way around then. Who here has heard of Bitcoin ordinals? Oh, there's a lot of hands. Who here actually own a Bitcoin ordinal? Uh, okay, not yet, I guess. Who here has heard of Sado Protocol? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't expect anyone because I'm gonna talk about it for the first time here because we have been working about, uh, on that. Uh, I'm using Chua. I'm a CTO co-founder of Cake DeFi. I've been in the Bitcoin space since uh, 2010. Um, yeah, active in the Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Dash ecosystem, uh, doing a lot of developments, um, building tools around that from the early days. Uh, I was uh, lucky to be the chief architect of Sand Dollar for the CBDC in Bahamas. Uh, still operating today, I'm no longer active in that project, but I'm still operating today. It's built on Bitcoin uh, protocol. And I was uh, also present, uh, lucky to be presenting in uh, FOSS Asia in 2016. Um, it's an interesting story on that one because I, my topic of that talk on, on that one was um, uh, something about uncovering or I'm covering a uh, government API or something. I got a police knocking on my door the next day <laughs> because I was uh, kind of like demonstrating how to reverse engineer uh, an API from a government uh, API and I got a police letter on my door the next day thinking I hacked to a government server, which I did not. I was just hacking uh, a software that's released by the government on my phone and showing, showing the, the audience how to do that. <laughs> uh, there's no case in, in the end, but it took like I think about like three months for it to be like canceled. Uh, no, like I don't hack any. I didn't hack anything. But it's interesting because of this talk, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, Bertha Research uh, is an it's an R and D arm of Cake DeFi. So, if you anyone here is familiar with Cake DeFi, great. A few hands. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So, Cake DeFi is a blockchain platform. That's not. It's not an exchange. It allows you to. Uh, grow your crypto in a very uh, transparent and open manner. Like all, all the yields are actually coming from blockchain, from, from protocols. You can actually track where the, all the yields are coming from. So it's not like a black box model like, like you would see on uh, I don't like FTX or Three Arrows. Like you, 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 you go in there, you can, they, they're going to give you some return, but you don't know where the returns are coming from. So at Cake DeFi, everything's very open, very transparent, and uh, you can see where all the yields are coming from. Uh, and Berthier Research is actually an arm at Cake DeFi that uh, what we do here is we contribute to open source projects prim primarily around the uh, blockchain space, uh, Bitcoin, uh, DeFi chain, Ethereum, and uh, now I'm uh, going to talk about the one specific project that we have been working on uh, that's on the Bitcoin space, on Bitcoin ordinals specifically. Um, yeah, with that moving ahead, let's talk about Bitcoin ordinals. Um, yeah, so if you're not familiar with Bitcoin Ordinals, this is what it looks like on the website, ordinals.com. I'm going to get into the details on what it is. Um, it looks a bit like uh, NFT, and I'm going to talk a bit on what it is. So it's also made the news that uh, it's kind of catching up right now that a lot of uh, ordinals are taking up the, the block space of, of Bitcoin. Uh, and we have uh, over a million uh, Bitcoin ordinals right now uh, that's uh, floating around in the space. And if you're a Bitcoiner, you also have seen that the Bitcoin block size has gone up uh, by many folds since about six months back. I mean, all has been around probably for a year now, but only about six months that way kind of take off because it supports uh, inscriptions. I'm going to talk about that later as well. Now, average Bitcoin block is about two megabytes. And before that, six months ago, it was like, that's like never over one megabyte. But now it's like two megabytes and sometimes even at, at a capacity of four megabytes. So, yeah, what are Bitcoin ordinals? Basically, what Bitcoin ordinals are, if you know what ordinals is in number theory, it's basically just um, ordering of things, like the first and second and third and, uh, and so on. So, for those who are new to the Bitcoin space or crypto space, one Bitcoin is, uh, can be broken down into 100 million, which is one E8. Uh, Satoshi, so the smallest unit on Bitcoin that cannot be divided further, it's known as Satoshi with a small letter S because the big S will refer to the name. Um, and every single Bitcoin can be divided into eight decimal places, and there will only be 21 uh, multiplied by 10 to the power of six. There will be only 21 million Bitcoin ever mined 
ever in the lifetime uh, of Bitcoin. Right now, I think we've mined probably 19 million right now, so only about three million to go. Uh, and it just, the, the mining just gradually go, goes down. So what orders are, are basically ordering of Satoshi. So you would order from the first Satoshi ever, ever minted or ever mined all the way to the last one that's ever been mined. So naturally, the first one is actually mined, mined by Satoshi himself and, and so on and so forth. So it's basically it's ordering of Satoshis. And so it's, you know, it's basically kind of, it's kind of a game that was started by, by the creator about how, how you can make Bitcoin kind of non-fungible, right? Because Bitcoin is meant to be fungible. Like the one Bitcoin that you get from John is the same as one Bitcoin you get from Alice. The same one is indistinguishable. But NFTs or you want to make something that's interesting, you want to differentiate the, the Bitcoin that you get from someone from the other Bitcoin. So you have to create a rule on how, if, especially if you send someone else a, the same Bitcoin, how do you track that all the way to, to who, whoever that's holding that? So you have to have a rule. So the person that created this basically just came up with a rule that if you, and on a Bitcoin system, there's multiple inputs and there can be multiple outputs. So how do you track that? Um, how do you even track that where, where, where that the same Bitcoin is going? So you just send a, kind of like a, an arbitrary rule. So the person, the creator, um, Casey picked up rule that says first in, first out. So if you have multiple inputs and multiple outputs, you're going to put um, the first one and you're going to match to the, to the same output and you're just going to keep distributing all the way to, to the last uh, output. So that's kind, of how, that's kind of how you track the provenance of, uh, of Satoshi, or in this case, uh, Ordinal, to, 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 to kind of track it all the way from, from it being mined. So with the Ordinal system, you can actually see where the Bitcoin is coming from, where the Ordinal is coming from, from the, from the moment that it's being minted at the first time. So if you get a Bitcoin, if you run through the odd server, you can actually see where it was mined, who it was mined, and you can track all the provenance all the way to, to, to where you hold it. If you look at through a normal Bitcoin kind of a transaction tracking, it's not quite clear because sometimes your coin gets mingled with other inputs and sometimes it's not, you, you just can't make it up where, where it's coming from. But, but if you set a rule, first in, first out, you can then track all the way. So to make it more interesting, um, the Orno system came up with this, with this idea. It's kind of like a fun idea initially. Like, why, like now that we can track, we can kind of make it non-fungible. Like, what more can we do with it? So the person came up with a, with, with, with a game on just kind of creating some ideas on how to make some, some uh, Bitcoin or some Satoshi more rare than the other. So uh, like there's some mod rule. You can kind of like go to Orno.com and read on how, how that's being derived. Basically, it's just arbitrarily defined on how rare uh, Satoshi is. So you can see here, there's a, there's a mythic um, Satoshi. I think you can kind of guess where, uh, which, which one is the mythic one, the very first one, which hasn't ever been moved uh, ever from, from day one. So here's, uh, so it's assigned as a mythic, and then the rest is kind of like, if you have some certain pattern, then it's gonna, fit into some of these um, like uncommon, rare, epic, legendary. So most of the Bitcoin that you get is gonna be common. And you can also see that there's a current supply here. So 19 million has been, has been mined. 19 million Bitcoin has been mined multiplied by 100 million. So that's 1.9 quadrillion. Um, it's kind of being split, split up. Even uncommon, it's kind of rare actually. If you get a Bitcoin, if you run through the system, it's very unlikely that you get an uncommon uh, Satoshi. So yeah, it's quite interesting. So. Bitcoin or knows. It's it's a digital artifact. Um, also, it's more it's more nerdy than than the NFT counterpart on Ethereum because there's a certain rule in place where um, it's also the reason why Arnold's community doesn't like it to be called NFT because NFT is basically a pointer to something that's arbitrary. Like if you had an NFT on Ethereum space, it can be point to a real world object, it can point to your sneakers, it can point to your your virtual world art piece can point to anything, and it's very arbitrary. The link is not real. Whereas for Bitcoin or nodes, there's a very specific rule that it has to be non, uh, it has to be uh, immutable. Like if you inscribe something on a spe very specific uh, um, Satoshi, it stays there. Like you cannot override it. I mean, it's just a rule is made up. So you, that I mean, that the rule is there. Like if you override something, it's not going to be valid as a as a Bitcoin or no. So no external link content is fully on chain. So kind of split the Bitcoin community into half as well because uh, there are some Bitcoin maximalists who say that Bitcoin should not be used to store data, it should only be used for financial transactions and do things that relate to Bitcoin itself. And right now we're using a lot of Bitcoin space to store like um, 
binary data. And the thing about Bitcoin is that these are, it stays there forever. So if you download Bitcoin blockchain, uh, it, you're going to have to download all this stuff as well. Uh, even though, like, because this uses the witness layer, technically it can be purgeable, but people are not purging it yet, just yet. And inscription is an added feature to ordinals, just so that instead of just a gain on a number, on, on how rare a Satoshi is, so it adds this feature to attach something to that Satoshi. So it's, it's called inscription. So uh, you can attach, like, image, you can attach... Uh, Audio, you can attach video to, to a certain Satoshi. So, so inscription is kind of like a feature to make all those more interesting. It was added kind of quite late, actually, like more than, I think, like six months or nine months in after Audio was uh, invented. Um, and it basically can attach any binaries. It's not limited to only things that are renderable on the web. You can attach anything at all uh, as long as it fits at four megabyte uh, space because that's the limit of a block. And uh, you can only fit that. And everything is fully on chain. So all the binaries are fine, but usually because you want you want to render down a website, you would only attach things like text, audio, image, and movie. It's kind of um um you gotta convert all the binary into uh into UTF, uh sorry, into uh ASCII, and then you gotta um, attach a mine tile on top, and then you're gonna put it onto the Bitcoin blockchain. So basically, this is how kind of how how, how it is. So this uh, on this example here, it's a it's a text that says "Hello World." You can attach it to the to the Bitcoin witness space, and this goes in there. And uh, you can see even the the logic here that uses a Bitcoin script. It doesn't really do anything. These are just uh, to attach that that binary data. So what's next? So we have all those. We have kind of like a token. What's next that people want to do with it? You want to trade that or not. Uh, I think as we speak right now, there are probably about, I would say, maybe eight or ten uh, kind of like trading sites out there. Uh, a lot of them are very centralized. A lot of them are very, uh, you have to log in there. You have to upload your Bitcoin. You have to uh, send them your Bitcoin. They send your or and then you can trade on a very specific site. So what we have here today is can we, can we make that even more decentralized, more trustless, because that's what Bitcoin is, and also what free and open source software is, and there's a reason why I got into Bitcoin in the first place, because I like uh, OSS, and I've been working with uh, on open source software for, for a while now. So trading, let's talk about trading first before I talk to marketplace. So trading, how to make trading works on a Bitcoin uh, system. Um, so firstly, before we talk about that, we have to introduce the concept of Ordinals and cardinals. So it's it's a name that Ordinals uh, user came up with to differentiate between non-fungible and fungible. Uh, so the non-fungible Satoshi is known as Ordinals, so everything can be tracked. Cardinals are it can also be Ordinals, but it's just basically just a way to say that these are just uh, Bitcoin, these are just Satoshis. So just to say just to call it cardinals, they are technically also Ordinals, but they just don't have much value. Right, so the beauty of Bitcoin model, the UTXO model, the unspent transaction model, basically allows for multiple input and multiple output. So you can send, if I, it's just like, it works exactly like a real world uh, dollar bill. Like if you have, if you want to, you go to a stall, you go to a restaurant, you want to buy a, let's say a drink, it costs $7, you have, uh, you have two $5 bills in your, in your wallet. You can pay the person, you, you're going to pay the, the cashier $5 and $5 and you're going to, and then you're going to, send seven dollar to the to the restaurant you're going to send yourself three dollar back so that's basically how bitcoin system works so in this, this example that i just gave uh, a hypothetical one i have two inputs which is the two of my two of my five dollar bills and two outputs which is the seven dollar to the restaurant and three dollar back to myself to a new address so so that works on the bitcoin side so on bitcoin we can actually make use of this very unique system to create a system where you can actually trade ordinals in a completely trustless manner without having to have an um, uh, intermediary to kind of facilitate that trade. So how it works is basically by owner of a, uh, of a uh, owner becoming the, um, taking away, I'm um, sorry, the owner of the um, owner taking the, um, the, the Bitcoin that's, that's been paid for, and then the buyer sending the Bitcoin over, which is the cardinal, 
and the buyer taking the honor from the original owner. So basically just switch of a input and output, switch it around, and the owner gets the output, the, the owner of the owner gets the output of the kernel, owner of the kernel gets the output of the owner. So it just works exactly on a Bitcoin system. So how it works a bit on a lower level side is either the buyer or seller. So so someone has to do this first. So the step on how this works is the buyer or the seller could craft a partitionally partially signed transactions. So anyone in Bitcoin space, you can craft any transaction. You, in order for you to sign it, you need to, you need to be the actual owner. You need to have the private key to sign something. But you can craft any transactions uh, on a Bitcoin space. So a buyer, obviously, you're going to negotiate the price first. And once you negotiate the price, you say, OK, I'm going to buy your NFT for uh, or those for, for one Bitcoin, for instance. So I'm the buyer here. I'm going to craft a transaction with my actual Bitcoin with your or no, and I'm going to send you that transaction. I signed my part, so you haven't signed your part yet. So you're going to get a transaction which is partially signed. You're going to validate that that one Bitcoin is true. If you accept the price, you will then sign your part of the transaction to say that okay, I accept this transaction. I'm going to sign my part. Therefore, I'm going to send you my uh, my one uh, my my or no, and I'm going to take your one Bitcoin. So it just works exactly like um, like how it is, and you don't need any. Uh, intermediary to kind of facilitate all that. It's completely trustless. It's also atomic. Like if you, if the um, if the, uh, the the owner of that or no doesn't like it, he doesn't have to sign it. Also, there's also an additional feature that can be added to make sure that that transaction actually expires, so that you have to sign it within a certain time, so that the 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 seller doesn't have to hold on, cannot hold on to that forever, and just sign it wherever he wants. So you can actually add a date as well for for it to expire. So Bitcoin supports all of that. So now that that works on the tr actual trading part, so the next thing is, the next problem that we need to solve here is that if you own a Bitcoin kernel, how do you announce to the world that you actually want to sell and how do you name the price that you actually want to sell? So you can go to some of those, some of those sites that, that, that I uh, talked about earlier that you can just list them on sale. But the problem of doing that is that some of them may require to give up ownership of your or custodial of your uh, owner to upload to the site. Therefore, you can trust the site to hold it for you, and uh, you can list it for sale there. Um, but can we make it better? Can we make it completely trustless and completely centralized? Sure, we can. So uh, this is what we worked on. It's called Sado Protocol. You are a Sado space. It's still in a work. I think the website is still kind of rough right now. But I'm going to kind of explain how it works. So it uses a combination of two technologies, IPFS and Bitcoin. So IPFS, if you're not familiar, it stands for Interplanetary File System. It's, uh, to, put it sim put it sim put it, to put it simply, it's, it's a torrent technology behind it. So it's like a bit torrent where uh, you run multiple seeds, and there are seeds all around the world. And um, you can, uh, if you send a certain file, it's going to jump across multiple nodes and uh, arrive at, at your destination. So it's kind of like a, a Bitcoin, I mean, bit torrent technology. So how it works in this case would be the maker. So I'm going to use maker as the... Um, as a person that's intent to sell an ordinal. Like it works on both cases, even for the buyer. So I'm just going to make it simple, like the person that intends to sell would be the maker. So the, the seller will create a JSON order and uploads the order to an IPFS, and that gives you the CID, content ID. So that order itself will contain the signature to prove that you actually own the ordinals that you're trying to sell. So you put it onto IPFS, IPFS will give the CID. You then send it on the blockchain itself the CID so they get broadcasted to the world. So anyone that participates in SATO protocol will listen to the Bitcoin blockchain to see if there's, is there any uh, broadcasting um, sale on the, uh, on the SATO protocol. So if you pick up one, you pick up the CID, which is a really, really small one, so it's not going to cost you a lot of money to put it on the Bitcoin blockchain. If you pick up the CID, you can then grab the data from IPFS, do your validation to make sure that the maker actually owns, a, owns the Arnold and it's still there and the signature valid. So the, the maker will actually have to sign that as well to prove that he owns that. If you, if you see that order and you're the buyer, you're going to get the IPFS and you like the price, you will then create the partially signed transaction just, just like I said, upload, upload the signed, partially signed transaction to IPFS. So you're going to sign it on your side first and you're going to upload the partially signed because you cannot broadcast the partially signed transaction over the Bitcoin. Only fully signed transactions can be broadcast over the Bitcoin network. 
So in this case, you're going to upload a partially signed transaction to IPFS. You will then send the offer CID through the Bitcoin system. This is a separate transaction, independent from the partially signed one. So you will create another Bitcoin transaction to kind of tell the seller that here's my order and here's my partially signed transaction. If you agree to that, if you agree to that, go to IPFS and grab the partially signed transactions, sign it on your side, on your own notes, and then you just relay. So you don't have to go through another round, another dance through the IPFS anymore because now that it's fully signed, the, 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 the seller can just broadcast it over the Bitcoin network and that completes the deal. So you got the full transaction on how, how uh, to, to initially announce your intent to sell to the eventually um, completing the deal. So in this case, there could be also multiple offers. Multiple offers. So if, uh, if, if, if a really um, good piece of art that gets a lot of offers, then you can basically decide which one you want to sign. It's kind of what it looks like on the Seda Protocol website. It's got a rec test right now, and it's um, working well. So Seda Protocol is free and open source. It's self-authenticating. So Seda stands for self-authenticating decentralized all order book, order book. So free and open source, self-authenticating. All signatures are validated before uh, before it can even be treated as a valid offer or, or, or a bid. And it has a default global order book, which means that any sites, any sites that that utilize the SATO protocol, you're going to be able to share the same order book globally, and there's no fee involved whatsoever. Everything is free. And it's also open to allow private use, like you can have your own private uh, SATO order book if you want to. It's all completely open. So to make it more user-friendly, uh, on birthday research, we're also working on a, another more of a front-end website to make it more user-friendly, so it's called Oddsar, or no Bazaar. Uh, it uses SATO protocol, and it's non-custodial. You don't have to upload anything. You don't have to send us a Bitcoin. It's just a viewer. You go to there, give it a string for you to sign. So non-custodial. You own your own Bitcoin. You own your own kernels. You own your own kernels. And the key thing about odds are is that the UX is going to be a little bit, I mean, for owners today, it's actually quite tricky compared to Ethereum because on the Ethereum ecosystem, it's very developer friendly. It's very decentralized app friendly. You have MetaMask. You have a lot of tools. You have a lot of JavaScript tools for you to build. Whereas on Bitcoin, that you don't have that right now. It's just kind of like just open up right now. So there's no de facto wallet. There's no there's no default wallet. If you ask Bitcoin, Bitcoin is what wallet that, that they use. You're gonna get like ten different answers. You can't even find a trend on what kind of a common Bitcoin wallet that people are using. So Arnold's support is also very very limited on Bitcoin wallets today. So if you buy an Arnold and you don't mark it properly because it's just like any other Bitcoin, you might accidentally send it out to someone else. If you pay like uh, like a ten thousand dollar for a very priced auto, you might actually send out, send out someone else because you don't mark it to not send it out. So you have to use a wallet that you can free to send UTXO to not resend it or use a, on, use a Bitcoin wallet that supports all nodes. And it's how it looks like. Um, yeah, for them, um, yeah, it's kind of a tight. Yeah, if you want to learn more about it, go to birthday.dev and space. Thank you. Yep.